and um, that's what I was just appointed as the acting ambulance director. And uh, <clears throat> mind you, some, a lot of us didn't have any uh, knowledge or background of a, of a pandemic. <laughs> I sure didn't have any idea of a pandemic. So when I uh, got into the position of the acting ambulance director, it was a learning experience on how to create policy on how to transport COVID patients along with keeping um, the ambulance uh, personnel safe. So it was a learning on the fly, creating protocol on the fly. So. Um, that was part of the uh, my role as the acting ambulance director at that time. Thank you, Tyler. And there was a lot of policies and laws and things put in place, like I showed during that public health <laughs> diagrams. Those are important. Those are important to managing and responding. Um, but we, we do have a task force who helps to guide. And thank you, like I said, once again, thank you for allowing us all to introduce ourselves to you. Like I said, we are all a team. This is a team effort. So it's important we all know each other and know what we do. So if we need anything, we can reach to each other and, and respond together. Um, so March 13th uh, was the state of emergency declared. So we are coming up on our one year anniversary here. Um, and the, like I said, this public health emergency response infectious disease ordinance was established on the 19th. So that's kind of what we follow. There's a lot of things in there. Um, and like I said, it is a living document. So we are gonna make some adjustments to that. So in addition, so it hasn't even been a year, but we know there's been challenges along the way. And, and one of the biggest challenges is the unknowns. We had no, like Tyler said, we had no idea. There's a lot of things we did not know. We didn't know anything about the virus, how it spread. We didn't know about the illness either. People were getting different symptoms um, and, and mortality was happening from this. And we always tried to, some, in the beginning, it was tried to be compared to the flu. And we've really, we've, <laughs> like I said, we're learning every day. We have realized it is not like the flu. This is a global pandemic. This is serious. Um, but the challenges in the beginning, we're trying to get, you know, get that information out and understand those pieces. The other challenges where we have some risk factors in our community that we know. We have pre-existing health conditions that, that make this virus more fatal. Um, and so we know we have those in our community. We also know that this virus affects elders um, and elders are very important in our community. And so, uh, you know, it, it does impact them at greater, greater rates. We also know that we have housing issues in our community. We have multiple generations living in one house um, and we have housing, you know, housing insecurities as well. And if we have multiple people in one house, that, that leads to us not being able to isolate and, and quarantine very well. So we know we have those things, um, those risk factors in our community as well. <laughs> uh, we also know the capacity for response is limited in our community, especially for limited data and limited resources. And we know that in our community, but we've also seen that happen nationwide in huge cities. Their capacity response, they, they have not had the capacity in huge cities with a lot of resources. So with our limited resources already, we knew we had a lot of risk factors in place. Finally, and not least, one of the challenges we've seen is the national and state politics. And I'm gonna emphasize politics because we know uh, the previous uh, national administration did not believe in science, did not believe in data, did not believe in prevention, including masks, and it has become politicized. This virus has become politicized outside of our bounds. But that also leads me to our strengths, which is we are a sovereign nation, and we do not have some of those politics outside of our bounds that have influenced mask wearing and social distancing and, and believing science and believing data. Our community and our people have been amazing. They have worn the mask. They have social distance. They have followed the, the policies and procedures we put in place to protect our community because our people and our communities have values. 
that we value our elders, we value life, we innately value science, right? Like we've, our ancestors have shown us how to survive and get through, get through illnesses and, and really, our, I can't say enough about our community and our people who have continued, you know, you go outside the res, our people are wearing masks, our people are following the prevention. So I just want to continue to say our, our community, and our people have been doing amazing and encourage them to continue. And that's what we're going to continue to try to do with this task force. And hopefully in our communities, we'll continue to do this um, throughout this until we truly, 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 truly know we're out of this. And I don't think, I don't know when that will be because if the, you know, the science of viruses, we know there are new variants. We know that this has spread, gone, spreading so long without um, mitigation outside of the reservation, they have mutated. So there are variants that are still, you know, we're following day to day. And so those are things that the task force will do. We will keep our community and you all informed on that and, and how to proceed. The other huge strength we have is science. Like I was talking about, the virus has mutated. There are variants. We understand that now. We are actually nationwide now finally following that and seeing where they're at. So we will have more information nationally uh, about that and be able to follow the science better because nationally we have a better response. We know the prevention is mask wearing, social distancing, and hand washing. That is what we know. <laughs> You know, so those are things we need to continue to encourage um, because science shows those are, the th those are the things we know. Finally, some of the public health pieces are con testing, contact tracing, quarantine, and isolation. And George talked about that a little bit. We're going to go into those pieces a little bit more. But those are things we know that help stop the spread. And that's what we want to do. We want to stop the spread and, and limit illness and death from this. And one of the newest things that we have are vaccines. So we have three vaccines that are being administered um, throughout the nation now, including Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson and & Johnson, and we will get to those. Um, but we have science. That is a strength. Our people, our values, and science are going to lead us. And, and that, those are things that have been guiding us in the task force as well. So I said we would get into each of these pieces. And so this is kind of, you know, all the pieces around this virus that we know from science. Um, one of the things is testing. So we do still have testing and testing in the beginning was very difficult. I don't know if any of y'all remember that, um, but it was so hard to get a test in the beginning. But currently we have testing at IHS Monday through Friday, it's drive-through testing. I believe that tent's in the back of the IHS now. Um, so you can go there and get tested. We also have tribal programs who have the Binax Now antigen testing, and those programs are the Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, Emergency Management, CHR, and Child Care. So those programs can use that test, um, and, and so testing has become uh, like more widespread, which is awesome. Also, South Dakota offers free tests, so there is a link on the South Dakota website, you can go on the South Dakota website and order a test if you, and, and they'll mail it to your house and you can have it at home and you send it in if you want to do it that way. So along the way, we have learned there are different ways to get testing, which is awesome. Contact tracing, like I said, these are some things we know reduce the spread. Uh, contact tracing is under Georgia's Health Administration and Public Health, the Public Health Authority. There are currently five contact tracers, um, potentially six more. Um, George let us know about that last night. Uh, those contact tracers, they contact and interview positive cases, close contacts, and then they monitor them in quarantine and isolate. They also deliver food and cleaning supplies to those in quarantine and isolation. So what, what is quarantine and isolation, right? In the beginning of this pandemic, we had all these different words, you know, and, and so we know these a little bit better. So quarantine is when someone comes in close contact to uh, someone who has been infected with COVID, they're required to quarantine for 14 days. Isolation is for those who have tested positive and they have to isolate for at least 10 days and not show a fever within 24 hours um, without fever reducing medication. 
There's only one tribal quarantine site in operation, and that is the Pinage RVs. Uh, we were notified yesterday that the ranch was was no longer in operation, and we'll be utilizing the Pinage RVs. So food and supplies to those, for those in quarantine or isolation, uh, the contact tracers also deliver those food and supplies. Let me see where I'm at. So this is kind of the process, what it looks like. You get testing. If you know, you're know you positive or if you've been in close contact, contact tracers will reach out to you. And then either you go into quarantine or isolation. And I want to turn it over to George if you had anything else to add to this or is this pretty clear as mud? Cool. I know in the beginning it was a lot of confusion, but this is like, this is the process now. This is the process we have down. And Councilman Carlo, did that answer your question about the, the sites? It, it does, but you know, uh, like Tyler said, you know, when, when this first happened, you know, it was totally new to all of us. And, you know, when they said herd immunity, he thought we were talking about our buffalo. So, you know, can, can we just touch on herd immunity too, please? Sure, so herd immunity requires a lot of things, a lot of pieces, including all these pieces, including testing, you know, all these pieces need to be in place, including vaccination. So vaccination, um, as you know, is very new. The, um, Dr. Fauci has, <laughs> has assured us that it is safe. And um, there, there's a lot of things to make this go quicker to get to the vaccination. And so herd immunity is a piece of that, but like everything, everything is evolving, right? Like we're learning new things every day. And in order to get herd immunity, you have to have all of these pieces in place. It's not just going to be getting everyone vaccinated. We're still going to have to wear a mask. We're still going to have to social distance. We're still going to wash our hands. We still have to do all of the contact tracing, quarantining, because herd immunity um, is one piece of it. But really what we want to do is get our numbers down so low that we can continue to move about and do things with, with the precautions in place. But I don't know necessarily if herd immunity is the, the main point of like, that's when we're there, right? And, and Rihanna is going to show a color, color um, level where we're at, because that's another piece where we're at. So I know people want to get to herd immunity so we can go back to quote unquote normal. But like this virus, like I said, this virus has changed, it's mutated, it's going to be with us for a long time. So I think that's another thing we need to talk about and think about is what is our new quote unquote normal? You know, we're, we're gonna have to wear masks for a very long time. We're gonna have to still continue to social distance and wash our hands. So that did not answer your question, I know that. Um, and I know there used to be throwing out of like 80, 70, 80% of herd immunity and that's one way to do it, but there's a lot of other components. So I, I believe, you know, the reason I wanted that brought up is I think, you know, our people might be under different assumptions that because they do get the vaccination, you know, that maybe it's all behind them. But, you know, I thought it was important, you know, that you told, you know, that we still have to take every precaution today. And I think our people are to the point now where, you know, it's something that we've adjusted our life to. And, you know, I really applaud our people by our numbers coming down, but a lot of that has to do with, you know, all the individuals that are working, you know, to corral this. So, you know, I think it's really important that what you discussed here so that our people understand that, you know, just because you got the vaccination, we're far from being out of the woods. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Councilman Carlo. Dr. Budrow, did you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, uh, Councilman Carlo, those are good points. Uh, I think the concept of herd immunity has actually done us a lot of harm because that's kind of the point of view of Governor Noam and, and former President Trump. And it's waved around a lot as the better solution uh, to uh, the COVID pandemic more than masks and hand washing and all the other things that you mentioned that we need to continue doing. Uh, we won't have vaccines for teenagers 
under the age of 16 until next fall. We won't have vaccines for children until the spring of 2022. And since Pine Ridge is such a young population, it's going to, we'll, we'll be way into 2022 before we can get uh, 70, 80% of uh, people vaccinated, including children and teenagers. So in the meantime, we have to keep taking the steps that you, that you outlined so well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Budrow. Yes, Councilwoman. Yeah, we have a question, I guess. Um, you know, you have a lot of young teens. Some of them are breastfeeding. So I guess that question to Dr. Butterbrock, you know, are those, can they take that vaccine now? I'd like to defer to Dr. Jumping Eagle if I could. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and actually we have a um, information uh, handout that I can send to people about the COVID-19 vaccine um, during pregnancy and in, uh, during breastfeeding. Um, and, you know, basically it's one of those things where they haven't done specific studies in those areas. Um, but the important information is that the, the vaccines don't contain the virus um, and the, you know, they do encourage the vaccine in these situations because it, it, the immunity will help keep the pregnant person safe and also keeps the baby safe uh, once they're born. Uh, some of the immunity can cross over to the baby prior to their birth and also um, we believe can also cross over through the breast milk as well. Um, so they do recommend um, the vaccine in, in those instances. Um, of course, it's good to always ask lots of questions um, about it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Yep. Another question I had, uh, Alicia, is uh, the food delivery, is that being uh, run through uh, your office, George? With the contact tracers, but where where does this fit in? Um, the COVID nineteen initiative office. There's still an individual who's working in there, um, and so we're just notifying her that we need um, food for certain individuals, and our contact tracers are going to doing that for them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for those count, uh, questions, Councilwoman. So the vaccinations has been one of our most recent, um, you know, efforts with a lot of collaboration and we got through our first phase, which, um, you know, we, we, we adapted the, the CDC guidelines, the med workforce group, and we uh, got through our first phase and now we're in phase two. So if you are, if you live on the Pine Ridge Reservation or you're a patient of the Pine Ridge Service Unit, um, Indian Health Service Unit and you're age 16 years of age and older, you can get a vaccine. And, and you can call and schedule um, Monday through Friday. You can go into the Cl uh, Pine Ridge Hospital, Kyle Health Center, Wombly, Lake Creek. There's also a, a Sunday um, outpatient clinic at Pine Ridge that from 12 to 4. So, and then also, oops, let's see where I'm at. Also, there's been some mass vaccination clinics because we do know people in our communities don't have transportation. Um, there are, we know we haven't reached all the communities yet and we're still working on that. But as you can see, there's been a lot of dates on here, a lot of places hit. So the other piece is capacity. Capacity um, of, of getting out to the communities, capacity of still running the hospital capacity. <laughs> you know, it, it requires a lot of people. And so we are going out to these places. There are some dates already set up for this month for those second rounds in those places. And we do know there are still some places we need to reach. But we are trying to get out to the communities with the Pfizer, Moderna, um, which require two doses. That's why we have to go back to those places twice. And we just received the Johnson & Johnson on the second. And so that will be available probably next week. Um, they have to finalize the training and the electronic health records. And then um, 
We're looking to utilize those in the corrections and shelters, those folks who kind of need the one dose and you know, you may not get them back for that second dose. And also we'll, we'll, the vaccine team will probably be um, talking about letting people have an option, right? How do we do that? And a lot of the stuff of the vaccines, just like the testing, was controlled nationally. So it started off slow. And then, you know, we did actually go for a little bit without Pfizer. There was a huge storm <laughs> across the nation in Texas and Oklahoma and that area that, that stopped, you know, that influenced that. So there are things that are happening na nationwide that are impacting us. But with this, like I said, with this new Biden administration, Things are trying to get on track and they are experiencing hiccups as well. And they're just trying to be transparent with the nation and, and we are trying to be transparent with our community as well here. So those are the three vaccines we have. And, and this is the awesome, uh, I'm sure you guys see this on the OST Health Admin Facebook page. This has been changed a number of times by, by George uh, taking feedback from the community about what they want in this chart, what would be helpful in this chart. As you can see, there's a um, number of new cases, close contacts has been added because those could turn into positives. You know, just this informational, I love this chart. This chart is so helpful. I'm sure all of you guys see it as well every day. It also is including the vaccines on there and hospitalizations and all those pieces um, that, that are pieces of information that are helpful for us. And George, did you want to say anything more about this or? So yes, like I said, this has been changed over time. This comes out every day. George, George is awesome in getting this out and keeping us informed. Um, and this, like I said, is guiding uh, our current understanding of the phase chart, which Rianne will talk about. But we do need to continue to get people vaccinated. You know, and so one thing, like Ryan said, that we will be talking about this is I did bring um, to the last council meeting utilizing the National Guard. One question that came up was, will, will we be charged? So as you guys can see, I did send out, or I put, put down, and I think I also emailed you, a signed um, cop letter from the National Guard saying there will be no fee. Uh, so HHS, we took that through HHS the other day when they met, and they did throw that along, and um, we are looking at potential dates for that, logistics and detail planning. Right now is the time. The, the state doesn't have as many vaccines as we have. And so right now, so once the state starts getting more vaccines, they're gonna be calling the National Guard out more. So now is the time for us to really utilize them and, and get more vaccines in people's arms and get people vaccinated because the state is gonna start calling them and having them go out. So we're really trying to get this moving forward. And, and so we can plan some of those logistics and details. And I know um, Councilwoman Carlo had some concerns about that. And so we we just need the okay so we can figure out those details and, and start planning those logistics, getting people there. Um, and so we just need the council's approval for a letter from, from President Killer to, to move forward with this. Councilwoman? Yeah, I guess my question is, uh, you know, I do in our district have some elderly that are bedridden. They're, they're, they can't make it to IHS. They're, uh, you know, I know I have one that's a stroke victim, but she's able to talk and, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure she's able to, you know, sit up and, you know, so when I talk with her, she really wants to get that vaccine, but I don't know, maybe a question for Dr. Jumping Eagle is, I don't know if anybody from IHS can go into these homes and do it. I know because of the COVID-19, there's probably restrictions, but we still need to get to those people, our tribal members, elderly especially, that are in this situation, you know, right now. So I want to know how are we taking care of those uh, tribal members? Is there any plan? Yes, I think. Dr. Do you want me to answer? Okay. Um, yes, we're working with um, our public health nurses and the CHRs to identify the people who are um, homebound and then um, working on a plan of how we can navigate that. Um, you know, one of the issues we're taking into account is that once you open one of the vials, you have uh, 
for the vaccines, depending on which time there's six to 10 doses in each one. And so we wanna make sure that when we go to deliver it, that we have a plan for the rest of the doses. So with the CHRs, we're coordinating, you know, who is, if they are homebound and then do they have other family members there? Or maybe if there's a couple houses, we could get at the same time. So we make the most of the vaccine and um, and we don't wanna waste any vaccine at all. So that's what we're working on right now. That is a great question. Um, and, and the logistics around implementing the vaccine or something else. So if anybody's looking to go out to those community vaccinations, try to get there about 15 minutes before the end. So at 2.45 or 15 minutes before the end, because you have to sit there and be monitored for 15 minutes. So just wanted to, there's all these logistics, all these plannings, all these details. And so for the National Guard, we do need council approval for that letter from, from President Killer to move that forward. So I don't know um, if we want to do that now. Yes, Councilman. Just, just a quick question. Uh, this uh, vaccination that we're getting, and we're being told it's a one-time thing. It's not like a flu shot. So from here on out, we don't ever need a, another shot. That is a great question, Dr. Jumping Eagle. I've watched different things on the news, but uh, can I defer to you on that one? I think it, you know, it's similar to everything that is happening with COVID-19 as we continue to learn more as we move through the pandemic. And so there are studies that are going on right now as far as how long does the immunity last? I think, you know, from my perspective and what we're learning about from CDC and nationally is that um, it could end up being similar to the influenza vaccine where, um, you know, it's a once a year thing. That's, you know, what I'm thinking of right now, uh, based on what we know, um, and we'll be preparing for, but that's, you know, has not formally come out at all from, from CDC. So I think we have to, um, it's basically wait and see what we find out, um, once more people are vaccinated. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman jumping in, I see you have a hand up. You know, I think if we're going to support this, um, Madam Vice Chair, I think, you know, there needs to be education going out to our membership, you know, that it that it's uh, that it's nothing bad. I mean, when you hear National Guard coming in, you know, just for example, last term we made a we made a motion to try to get land back in black in the Black Hills that quick. It turned around that we were trying to sell the Black Hills. You know what I mean? So, I mean, information needs to get out on, on what we're doing, you know, that, that, it's, that, that it's a support effort on the part of the state to try to help. I mean, um, is all that stuff going to be going out, right? If this, is, if this passes and, and we support it? Yeah, we, we just need approval so we can start moving ahead on that. Because if we take time to work on that and it doesn't happen, <laughs> then that's time spent on something that's that's not going to happen. So yeah, we, that like like I have like we just need approval so we can start moving on that and getting information out, planning, um, and, and getting those pieces in place and letting folks know that you know the National Guard is coming to do vaccinations for our community and that is it. So did that answer your question, Councilman? Yes, yes, it did. So I don't know if we want to wait because I see the, I don't think we have a quorum in here right now. Um, so we can wait till HHS is that work for you, Chair? Yes. Um, it, it works for me. Sorry. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah. The, the, oh, sorry, sorry, Chair, but there's no quorum in there right now. Um, yeah, there's, there's just four of us here, Riot. I think some of them stepped out. Uh, Sergeant at Arms needs to get on it. Yes, <laughs> Councilman Hawkins. Is uh, Governor Noam going to allow all this?
This is an initiative of President Biden. It still needs Noam's approval. Um, uh, Councilman, thank you for that. Uh, um, you know, that, that was one of the things that, you know, I think we're mindful of that when we initially met with the National Guard, um, you know, the, the, the politics of that. And I think it, it, it is, it does need their approval, but at the same time, it's helping people. You know, at the end of the day, I think that's probably the biggest thing is that, you know, we need to make sure that we get our all, all of our communities vaccinated with um, the resources that we have and being able to partner. And that is our right as, um, you know, as, as try, try citizens of, of the state um, that, you know, we're, we're first and foremost citizens of the law of the nation. We also have a unique role as being uh, citizens of our own Oglala Cruz County and also as citizens of South Dakota, you know, and it is something that, that there is a, a denial, you know, that that would be kind of, um, I think that'd be unprecedented. But I think also the National Guard is, is kind of, you know, the, the leadership is behind us and, uh, you know, it's something that we can kind of take back. And it is, it is her right to deny that. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I think um, one of the options is just trying to figure out how do we um, get this out, especially if it's an initiative of President Biden. And we could definitely put that in the letter. So, but it is, it's a unique thing. And the other thing too is that I want to update the council on is that uh, Representative Puyer had a bill up on missing and murdered Indigenous people and that passed uh, out of Senate Judiciary uh, unanimous 550. So, um, so they are going to, you know, they are looking for ways to to move forward on different things. So, and sometimes, you know, you can disagree to disagree. Um, but, you know, just helping people at the end of the day, I think is, is one of the initiatives and reasons why that, you know, it would be good to kind of see this move forward, you know. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Brokenoff. Right there, I got it. <laughs> A lot of technology here. You know. uh, my voice is here and another my voice is here. So. <laughs> I have a couple, maybe uh, three questions. Uh, I want to say a little bit about it. <clears throat> a Kavodi vaccine shot. For example, if you get the shot, how long will it stay in your body? I know what man made is not forever. The God created the God or country God is forever, but man made is not. So my question is how long the vaccine will be in your body? I can take that. I think Dr. Dr. will kind of explain that. Um, we don't know yet. We don't know. We, you, yeah. It could be you need a booster later on or something. We don't know yet. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I've been listening just about every day. And no answer, nobody says what is really a COVID virus. And <clears throat> I know it's a disease that's going around. It's not just today. It's been one year yesterday, one year yesterday. But it's not just that one year. It's been going around for the last eight years. We don't know. How many of you guys hear the whirlwind noise like a train is coming? How many of you guys hear that whirlwind noise? I could hear it. It's going like a whirlwind tornado going around. So wherever it starts, it's going bigger, bigger, bigger. And throughout the world, the COVID is going. In some places, they said it's stabilized, slowing down. Yeah. The vaccine is not forever. It's going to come back to us. Maybe a year from now, or maybe six months from now, it's gonna hit us hard again. That's my question is, how long that shot's gonna last you in your body? 
Well, I think also that's why we still have to wear our masks. We yeah. still have to social distance. So we still have to wash our hands. We still have to do everything because you're right. Yeah. You know, there's many pieces to this puzzle yeah. and the vaccine is just one, so. Yeah. We're God's children. We're God's people. Yeah. The prayers. I never heard anybody, any tribes. Well, let's get together and pray about this. Kobayi. It is going wrong. I didn't hear nobody. We did. I think back in May, we pray at Porcupine. Power and God, we pray. We all got together and we pray. But still, some of our people, few people cut the virus and we lost them. But not a whole a lot. We still protect. And a test for it is going on. What, what did they find out about it? How are we going to do it? What are we going to do? I know you mentioned mask, and everybody mentioned mask. I don't wear mask for ever since one year. I go Rapid City, I go wherever. I am an indigenous Lakota spiritual leader. I carry your medicine. I pray, not just for myself, young generation, elder people. We pray. That's the only answer. And like I said, it's been going on eight years. I asked several people, but no, I didn't hear nothing. You're a special person. You could hear things. But we're not, you said. Okay, that's good. You mentioned a National Guard right there, Augusta Tribe. Each and every human have our rights. We have rights. We are a sovereign, a sovereign nation. Why a National Guard come in after load me in a truck and take me over to wherever and give me a shot? No, I disagree that National Guard. We are a sovereign person. We are a sovereign people. You can't force. I know each and every one of us, we know what COVID is. It's a deadly virus. It could go five years or it could go 10 years. But how are we gonna protect ourselves? We say mask, okay, well that's fine, let's go. But I don't like that National Guard. I am a sovereign person. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rognos. So per the CDC, we do not know how long the protection lasts for those who are vaccinated. We don't know that. What we do know is that COVID has caused very serious illness and death for a lot of people. So if you get COVID-19, you're also at risk of giving it to loved ones um, who may get very sick. And so getting a COVID-19 vaccine is a safer choice at this point. And experts are working to learn uh, more about both the natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity, but um, the CDC keeps giving public information as new evidence becomes available. The National Guard will not pick anybody up and take them anywhere. People do have a choice to get the vaccine. We're not saying this is mandatory. You do have a choice to get the vaccine. The, the National Guard will just help us with capacity. Like I said, we, we are going out to the communities, but we need more capacity to get more shots out. And the National Guard just provides more bodies, more medical professionals to get those shots in arms. So thank you, Mr. Brokenos, for your, for your comments. I know this is a very difficult time where we all have different thoughts and, and feelings about this and, and, you know, those unknowns, you know, provide us, you know, that, that's a big thing of those unknowns. Um, but, but Councilman Jumping, I saw you had your hand up earlier. I didn't know if you still had a comment. Okay. 
Okay. Councilman John, can you hold, um, I saw you had your hand up earlier. Did you have a question or comment? Oh, sorry, I forgot to take it down. So, do we want to discuss this in HHS, uh, like, or any more questions or comments about bringing in the National Guard to support getting vaccines to people as an option for people? Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you. You know, I just, I talked about it, I think, so I'm blue in the face and you're probably tired of me here, tired of hearing it from me as well, but, you know, that's a key piece, that educational piece on the, on the National Guard and what their role is, you know, that people understand what and exactly they're going to do, you know, as uh, Richard mentioned, you know, we all have a right. We all have a right to choose if we want to have the vaccination or not. And anti-vaxxers, we have them. And that is their right to, to deny that. But um, I just want that out there so people truly, fully understand the role that they will play. It's not to pick up people and um, force them. It's nothing like that. So just, you know, that that can get out there and people are fully aware of that. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Councilwoman. And yeah, like I said, we, we're just waiting for the go so we can get that information out. And we did meet with the National Guard last week and they said they would be happy to come and meet with people, maybe be able to do a panel with them or something like that as well for education. Was there an Yes, Councilman Puyer. Okay. Um, is, do I understand this letter that I just sent us out to the National Guard? I'm the one on your desk, or on your screen. Yeah. Because then the person writes back saying that's to get uh, authorization from the governor. Sorry, was that question for me or this Dr. Jumping Eagle? Because it says, and the one that's responding was come from the military, so I'm wondering who sent them, who sent it out to the National Guard? This is preliminary conversations to, to figure it out. So we did have Steve um, reach out as well. So Steve, I know you are on. Did you have, I think you're still on. Yeah, so one of the things that we, we talked about is doing a, um, so we can get to more of the community is doing a, um, collaborative effort. Um, but one of the things we reached out to talk to them about was um, the, the concern about cost. Um, you know, what it would cost to have uh, the National Guard come assist in a support role um, with vaccinations. Um, so, I mean, it, it's right now, it's just it's just a, a conversation that we're, we're having for extra manpower to actually um, to do the vaccines. Um, and that's something that the tribe will be will be heading up along with IHS, and um, if if choose to do, it'll be the National Guard involved. I guess what I'm going at is, is who authorized this to be sent out? Could just anybody, any program, any department do this? No. Uh Officially, I guess when, when we, we make requests or anything like that, like we like we've done through the um, through the floods, we go through the, the channels because we're in an active um, emergency declaration right now. We go through the state, so we talk to the state and, um, and and find out what kind of resources are out there for us to to utilize for something like this, whether it's mass uh, mass vaccination or mass testing, 
or any kind of resources like that, we, we go to the state OEM office. But in any time that you want to utilize the National Guard for anything that has to go to the governor's office. But before we get to that point, I guess we, we wanted to find out any information, what the cost is, if, if that's a viable solution for what we're trying to do. Um, so it's just legwork before we even make a decision to um, bring to council for any kind of support for that. So you took it upon yourself to do this for for collecting the for for collecting the data for what the cost. When did you even get authorization from the president or the vice president of the Valley Trail? Yeah, this is this is a discussion that we had in our task force, and um, we reached out to find the cost for utilization of the National Guard. That's what was asked of me. So that's that's what I've done. To me, to me, to me, I think the way it's supposed to work is you're supposed to get authorization from some executive committee or the tribal council to the because the reason I'm saying this in the past when the National Guard came here, the at the end there was a dollar involved. When, a couple of years ago when they brought water they turned around and then they submitted a bill to the tribe so when we we're asking them to help vaccinate haul people around whatever they're going to do is there a dollar amount involved in the end for this for this effort it will go directly to fema it won't go to the tribe Mr. Mr. Wilson, that was told to the tribe before, even on the water. Right, and we didn't pay for that. To do anything, not with, with FEMA or the National Guard at the present time. Thank you. We, we didn't pay for that uh, that resource, the, the, the state did. Yes, Councilman. Yeah, I think some of us have been kind of in this circle for a while and we kind of went through some of these uh, things that are being talked about. I think one of the things that I'm kind of getting out of this letter is something that you're proposing to the tribal council, right? So this letter is just to show that there is no fee. So yeah. we wanted documentation of that. So this is what that letter is. Yeah. The National Guard did come down and confirm that. Okay, so I guess I'm just uh, saying that there's no, you're just proposing this because I think I heard you mention earlier about getting council's approval for the letter. Yes, we went through HHS and yeah. showed them this and said what we need is a, a letter from President Killer. Yeah, okay, so that's the process that you're following right now. Yes, ma'am. And I think that, um, I think that's where we need to get that clarified because, you know, I think in the past we did uh, kind of run into some issues with FEMA. And I think uh, Ms. Steve knows what they are. And I think that it's come to, I think, a point with the tribe is that sometimes we don't uh, really trust FEMA. But at the same time, you know, we're just making sure that we don't get charged for anything, you know, other than the fact that uh, they'll provide technical assistance which is they're saying they're gonna come down and help with providing the vaccine to our membership, right, in the communities. And um, to me, I think I see that as a, as a plus because I think I just, you know, I just asked that question about our tribal memberships that are still at home that do need to be vaccinated. They want the vaccine. They just cannot get to IHS to do it. So if we should have something like this, down the road, I think that would help, you know, uh, some of our tribal members that can't get to Indian Health Service to get that vaccine, you know, so I'm kind of hoping that that's how it's going to work and that they're not going to charge us for anything other than I, the fact that I just read the letter and that's kind of what they're proposing. So, you know, you did follow the process, you took it to a committee, which is HHS, and now you're bringing it to the council. And if the council approves it, uh, given the the letter to send out. So I just wanted to get that clarified. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you for clarifying. Oh, you know, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I can jump in real quick here. And, um, I, I, you know, I did meet, well, we did have a meeting, I think, at the end of our general council meeting uh, in January, where I did have a chance to visit with the White House. You know, that was one of the first initiatives of President Biden was to actually uh, all FEMA costs associated with COVID, all this kind of stuff, um, was 100% reimbursable. So, and Jennifer Hughes did send out that memo to all of your emails, so you should have gotten that. And it should be, you know, it says it right there, uh, all cost, you know, so, but I do understand the hesitancy and I appreciate the council's steps for actually making them get this letter and putting it in writing because that way it, it's, um, you know, that way there's something, if, they, if there's any uh, misunderstanding, then that we can always go back that, that that letter, you know, so, but it is, I mean, from my understanding, um, and it is uh, a memo that Jennifer Hughes did send out um, that, that, FEMA cost is 100% reimbursable, and it is an issue that we're present writing to get the country back on track. So, yes, Councilman DeBrin. Uh, I'm understanding what Dave was just explaining to us, and we were part of that FEMA issue, and we still haven't been paid for that disaster that we supplied it, uh, supplied a dollars to and we were supposed to be in reimbursal. So my question is this letter is from the National Guard stating that FEMA is going to pay 100% of the stock. Do we have a letter from FEMA stating that they are going to uh, pay that, accept that cost? Steve. Yeah, for the discussions that we had with the National Guard, they would also provide a letter stating that um, how that payment would work. It would be submitted directly to FEMA. It wouldn't wouldn't come to the tribe. Okay, I mean, it sounds all good and cozy right now on paperwork, but we've been through this. You know, we're kind of leery about FEMA. Yes, Councilman Watkins. Yeah, you know, um, like Ron and Davian and said, you know, Sonia, we've been through all this, and I'm reading this letter, it says that you got to have the approval from Governor Christie Dome. And we all know that we haven't been getting along with Christie this last couple of years. So, you know, there's no guarantee saying that, you know, we're going to still end up with the bill. Those are all fair comments. I think the thing that the the um, task force is coming from is getting vaccines in people's arms. So I understand all those pieces and, um, you know, the letter is here in writing. And um, I know you asked for the letter from FEMA as well. Um, I think Kevin has a direct line to Biden. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but our point is just trying to get vaccines in arms. So, uh, and with the National Guard's help, we can get more vaccines out. Um, I think they look to get about 1,000 out a day. So we could potentially in one week and get 2,000 vaccines out in two of our communities. Yes, Councilwoman Carlo. Um, thank you again. What are some of the factors in regards to individuals not getting vaccinated? My understanding is there's some clinics uh, are vaccination clinics in the, some of the outlying communities, but people aren't showing up. So why are they not showing up? Do we know why? Is it due to the roads? Is it due to lack of um, funds for gas? What, what are the contributors to that? I think that's a great question. We haven't looked at that data wise or scientifically or anything like that. And we can all come up with our own, you know, reasons why, you know, and we all, I'm sure we all have stories of people we've talked to and, you know, they kind of waited and then they decided to do it or, you know, some information they got really helped them to, to do it. And you mentioned there are people who just do not get vaccines for a number of reasons. So we don't know that statistically wise, but you know, the more we reduce those barriers to getting into people's arms, that is a huge thing for any health care um, is reducing barriers, right? So the other piece of if we do bring this in, we, we're looking at getting transportation 
and those things to get people in and into those sites to get those vaccines. So there's, it's just reducing barriers, I think, is another piece of getting it out there. I think uh, getting our own transportation system up and running is a key to a lot of this as well. You know, our people do need those services. So I think that's a, a big part. For sure. And we also have had schools volunteer and say they would help out with that as well, right? So that's pretty cool that our community is coming together and really wanting people to reduce those barriers and get the vaccine. Uh, and we mentioned it is one piece of this whole puzzle, but it is a piece that we're working on right now and, and need help with getting out there. Yes, Councilor. Oh, I'm sorry, were you done? Okay. Councilman Yelder? So, uh, <clears throat> I guess my question would be, uh, what's stopping us from having our own IHS employees administer this and why? I mean, for me, I, I visited with a couple of people who don't anti-vax or they're anti-vaxxers. They, they believe in the natural way. And I'm going to move this. I can't there so <clears throat> i guess my question would be why are we bringing in the national guard or looking at bringing in the national guard when we have a service unit not only in pine ridge but in kyle and wambali to help administer these vaccinations so the, they are going out the other part is the hospital is opening up so it requires certain medical people to administer the, the vaccine. So nurses and doctors and, and pharmacists, we know we have a limited number of those and we still need to conduct our daily medical things at the hospital as well. Um, I would also like to turn it over to Dr. Jumping on that one. Well, I guess I'm not done yet. So um, <clears throat> for me, it looks like we're rounding people up if we bring the National Guard in. And that's why the other day during HHS, I voted no. I don't want to be perceived as the council that's sending out the National Guard to round people. You know, we're, we're, we're in that area where, you know, back in the day, they brought us our rations and whatnot and smallpox blankets and, and everything else. So, you know, to me, I don't want to have that persona as, okay, we're bringing the National Guard to round our people up, especially if they don't want to take the vaccine. Thank you. Um, is that, did you have anything else or did you want me to? Okay. Um, no, I totally agree with that. And then um, we also have a comment. Uh, and, and I think that's a part of the education that Councilwoman Carl was talking about, right? That we would have to get out and that we would do once we get approval. We, Like we said, the National Guard came in, they said they would come and meet, you know, and, and it is a thing that when you mention National Guard, right? Um, and so that, that does cause alarm, uh, but we're in, a, we're in a pandemic and we need the support. But uh, I'd like to turn, uh, Thomasina had a comment. So Thomasina, I don't know if you wanna jump in and mention that comment. Uh, sure, can you hear me okay? Oh, <laughs> sorry for the background. Uh, just really quick on the FEMA question, President Biden in his second day in office, so January, 21st, 2021, he issued a memorandum to his agency, FEMA, that directed um, FEMA to fund 100% of the cost activities associated with the, the mission assignments for the use, use of the National Guard to respond to COVID. Um, and then in the chat, I, I attached the link to the White House memo. With, it has a lot more detail about that and what that entails. But the councilman is right that I think it requires also the governor of the state to authorize the use. I don't know if that's happened here, but um, there's some background on the 100% cost share. Thank you, Tom Cena. Councilman Poyer? Yes. Along with what Tyler said, you know, last Thursday or Friday, I don't remember what day it was, but they vaccinated down at the Rocky Ford School. And when I was told, is that they ran out of uh, the vaccine. Now, granted, uh, the Rocky Ford School is, uh, the population is not that big down there, even though a lot of kids go to school there. But why can't 
they come to the communities where there's a greater amount of people where the people wouldn't have to drive so far to get the vaccination. I and mean, they could go to by the ball diamond at Porcupine, I mean, at Evergreen, they could go up to Porcupine, they could go to Alla. I mean, they could go to Red Shirt. I mean, any number of these communities where the people wouldn't have to drive. I mean, uh, I just don't like the perception of uh, the National Guard coming in. Uh, uh, but if we have, if that's the way to get our people vaccinated, we want to take it to them, not for them. Because my understanding is, even it's even slowed down at the hospital, the people come in to get vaccinated, and, and at Kyle Clinic. So how come we can't spread it out to the communities to make it give it easier access to those that maybe didn't get vaccinated? So I can partly answer that and then I can have Dr. Dumping Hill jump in too if she has anything to add. But the other part is, so the, the vaccine needs to be kept at a really cold temperature. And so implementation for the vaccine is is uh, requires planning. Uh, like she mentioned earlier, the vial has a certain amount. So once we take it out, plus we still have to, if we go to Evergreen, like that's a good idea. Like those communities that, especially Porcupine, right? Our community is really spread out, you know? So it's hard to find places and to, to administer them. And for the, you know, we haven't tried drive-through vaccines yet because you still have to monitor people for 15 minutes. So that part has to be worked out, right? So there's, a, these are all amazing and great questions and, and we're still figuring it out. But, you know, the National Guard is one piece of this puzzle too to help us get them in people's arms quicker. So um, Dr. Jumbo, do you have anything else to add to that or? Yeah, um, I think, you know, as the PSAs that we've been sending out uh, frequently, we are continuing to provide the vaccine at um, Pine Ridge, Kyle, Wombly, um, and the three clinics. We also have um, the mass vaccination events that have been in Pine Ridge, uh, Kyle, uh, Rocky Ford, Porcupine. Uh, we have planned events at Wombly. We're working on confirming locations and dates for Allen and Manderson. Um, and, you know, we've been sending out PSAs weekly um, or sometimes two to three times a week as we get locations confirmed. So, so I think, I mean, that's not an issue of, you know, we're trying to go out to as many places as we can. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we're working on um, uh, collaborating with corrections um, and also um, looking at how we can continue to reach out to those who have high risk medical conditions or people that have uh, difficulty leaving their homes as well. So those are ongoing efforts. I think, you know, as the task force um, and myself, we've also gotten lots of questions about when is the community going to reach uh, her quote unquote herd immunity, um, as you know, the CDC discusses, um, and also lots of questions about the COVID virus variants and um, the contagiousness. I think Right now, we're benefiting from the low numbers of COVID positivity um, in the community, um, which is great. Um, but we don't know if and when that will change. Um, we know that on both the East and the West Coast, they had gone through that first surge um, a year ago. And then they just recently, a few months ago, had another surge of COVID where it overwhelmed um, even California systems where they were ran out of ICU beds. So I think, you know, the um, in discussion with the task force about, you know, what are other ways we can maximize, um, you know, offering the vaccine to the community and helping navigate that um, is to try to vaccinate as many people as we can in, in, you know, shorter periods of time so we can reach that herd immunity at an earlier date before we potentially see another surge of COVID cases, um, you know, if the variants change um, or we get another wave going across uh, the nation. Thank you, Councilman, does that answer your question? Okay, Councilman Jumping Eagle and then Councilman Carlo. You know, you know, there's, so just for clarification, we didn't, we didn't approve of it in HHS. We just forwarded it on to council because we knew there's going to be a lot of questions um there's still too much questions you know i know i know it, it's meant to help 
but I mean, there's still too much question. So I'll motion to table and send back to committee. We have a motion to table. We got a second by Councilwoman Carlo and Councilman Youngman. Madam Secretary, can call the vote, please. Brian, for clarification, that is regarding the National Guard portion of it, right? Yes, only that portion. Thank you. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Cora Whitehorse? Yes. Ryan Jumpinigo, Sr. Yes. Gerald Canoya, Jr. Yes. Yes. Austin Hawkins, Sr. No. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy? Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Ron DeBray? No. Oh. James Cross? Yes. Hello, John Carlo? Yes. George Dreamer, Jr.? Yes. Richard Ironcloud? Yes. David Clear? Yes. Sonia Littlehawk Weston? Michael Carlo, Sr.? Yes. Garfield Still? No. Craig Dillon? Yes. Sonia, would you like to vote? It's to table the National Guard portion of this. Uh, and send it back to HHS. Yeah. <clears throat> 18-4-0 against. Okay. All right. So moving on. Um, yes, Councilman Arnko. I've got a question from one of the community members from Porcupine. Porcupine, and they said, uh, "How come our tribal task force tells us not to travel around and go places, and the tribal council still travels off the res every weekend for committee meetings?" So on the um, so travel was opened up by by council and then also in the uh, shelter at place shelter in place there's essential governmental travel on there um, and we will get to the color coded uh, we still have some other things uh, but I hope that answered your question okay so education we do have some educational institutions looking to to open we do have an educational institutions COVID nineteen health order for reopening schools ordinance twenty fifty seven. I did email that to you guys for your um, reference because there are a couple schools looking to reopen. We got Ogallala Lakota County Schools and Red Cloud Indian School to reopen. And the task force has been meeting with them to go over their plans and, and to um, make sure that they are fit, fitting in the ordinance 2057 to pass on to education. So you guys will be seeing those in education soon. So this is the, the COVID-19 uh, level indicator. And this is, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Ryan Redow here for this. She's worked on this because our numbers have gone down and you know we, we have seen people masking up and, and taking care of each other and reducing those numbers and getting vaccinated. So uh, I'll stop sharing and Ryan, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, um, Dr. Moose. So can um, I get screen share or does everybody have a copy of the chart? We have a copy and you can also screen share. Okay, so um, the task force recognizing that, you know, we need to move forward uh, in this pandemic and with council taking action and people out there traveling, um, 
we thought we, we realized we need to get something out there for everybody to see and something to give us some guidance. Um, so looking at all the um, surrounding states uh, and, and states across the, the country, um, we kind of looked at what they were doing and several of the states are using uh, risk level charts in order to uh, make decisions, to help them make decisions. And um, in certain areas, uh, in certain levels, um, you know, uh, the government will um, take action in order to um, either do lockdowns or stay at home orders or whatever uh, type of legislation that they may need to do. <clears throat> Excuse me, I get short of breath sometimes. Um, I'm a, I think I'm a long hauler here for COVID. So I've got, uh, I get short of breath. Um, I have the color coded chart. Um, we did have the epi epidemiology center look at it up at Great Plains. Um, it's a little bit more comprehensive than what they do. And um, um, this is a, a a foundation. This is something that we're going to start working with. Um, we can use it now. As of today, we could use this. Um, but we we need to monitor it. So this is um, information. We have uh, indicators. We have alert levels. We have four, four levels, green, yellow, orange, and red. And in the green level, that's your, uh, the, the, the disease is mild or it's severe, but it doesn't spread easily from person to person, mm -hmm. um, and it's being contained. And, and the indicators that we're looking at are uh, a seven-day positivity rate, new active cases over a 14-day period, um, whether there's a sustained increase in active cases over uh, five consecutive days over a 14-day period, um, emergency department visits for COVID-like illness over a 14-day period, and the number of hospitalizations. So those are the indicators that we're looking at. Um, and then based on the data, and we're pulling the data from the daily updates that, um, that George does. And we're doing a 21-day look back. So we're looking back 21 days to make sure that we get a, a, a full 14-day period to look at, including a full seven-day period to look at. Um, when I first did this uh, was February 19th. We were in the orange level. Uh, and that was just to, uh, uh, that was kind of the, the initial uh, draft of it. And then on February 28th, we are now in the yellow level. Um, but there's this, I'm saying this with words of caution because of the, we have, we have met two indicators in the yellow level. However, um, we have over 20 um, new cases and that falls within the red level. So um, we need to, we, we're watching that. If that continues to increase, that's probably gonna bump us back up. And right now, the past three days, we've had um, uh, increases in our cases. So uh, within the next two days, if, if we continue to have positive cases coming out of it, um, we will probably uh, bump back up. It'll depend on, of course, the other indicators, but um, we're watching for that. So with this chart, um, we have recommended actions within each uh, level. So in the green level, people can uh, do what, what we're recommending is that people do self checks for symptoms and stay at home if they're symptomatic. And of course, the social distancing and um, face coverings and avoid high risk areas, hand hygiene, Avoid touching your face, coughs, cover your coughs and sneezes. Um, the businesses and, and government offices can be open. There should uh, be a plan in place um, to ensure that uh, the safety measures are continuing to be followed, such as your social distancing and, and mask wearing. Um, schools, in the if we're in the green level, schools can be in person with a plan and 
also following the tribal health orders regarding education activities. In the yellow level, um, this is where the disease is severe and spreads easily from person to person, but it's occurring outside of the reservation or the disease is spreading within the reservation. It could be severe, but it's mainly in the vulnerable groups or the disease is being contained and at least two of the following indicators are met. And again, that's the positivity rate, which would fall between 5% and 7.9. Um, as of February 28th, we were at 7.7. .7, so we're kind of on the high end there. Um, two or less new cases over a 14 day period, no sustained increase in active cases of at least five consecutive days over a 14 day period, one to five ED visits for COVID-like illness over a 14-day period, one to five hospitalizations over a 14-day period. Those would be the indicators that would put us in the yellow. And the recommended actions are to continue to follow the safety measures in the green level, such as the mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, avoid travel to high risk areas, avoid contact with anyone who is considered high risk. Businesses and government can be open with a plan Telework in hybrid workplaces um, should be in effect. Um, schools in person with hybrid plan and follow tribal health orders regarding education activities and gathering less than 50 with safety measures. Um, in the orange, um, the disease is severe and spreads easily from person to person, but the disease has not spread mm -hmm. widely across the reservation and is being contained with at least two of the following indicators met. And uh, the seven day positivity rate in the orange level would be um, eight to 9.9%. And the new cases would be in the, in would be three, in, from three to 19 new cases over a 14 day period. There would be a sustained increase in active cases of at least five consecutive days over a 14 day period and greater than five emergency department visits for COVID-like illness over a 14-day period, and greater than five hospitalizations over a 14-day period. The recommended actions in the orange level are to decrease in-person interactions with others, necessary travel only, limit gatherings to 10 or less, telework slash hybrid workplace, mask, hand hygiene, social distancing, businesses at 50% capacity, schools in person with hybrid plan and follow tribal health orders regarding activities. <clears throat> in the red level, the disease is severe and spreading widely across the reservation and at least two of the following indicators are met. The seven day positivity rate would be greater than 10%. There would be more than 20 new cases over a 14 day period there would be a sustained increase in active cases of at least five consecutive days over a 14 day period. There would be a sustained increase greater than five emergency department visits for COVID like illness over five consecutive days in a 14 day period. And there would be a sustained increase in hospitalizations and a critical shortage of hospital staff or PPE. And in this, uh, in the in the red level, this is um, would be a major disruption to reservation activities, and could possibly lead to lockdown measures, um, as we've had in the past. Um, this is where we would want to have a shelter-in-place ordinance in effect, and only allow for essential business, essential travel, essential activities such as um, obtaining food, supplies, and medical services. Um, essential government services should should be the only um, governmental activities uh, going on. And also telework, schools should be distance learning only, no gatherings of 10 or more. Um, and of course, the mask mandate, all the all the other uh, standard precautions, safety precautions. So this is what we're working on. It can be made public. It can be posted everywhere um, so that everybody has uh, access to it and can see it. And it would be updated every 21 days unless there is a um, significant spike. And if in that case, um, the alert level could change. So 
this is something that um, we are recommending um, to be added to our um, infection, uh, infectious disease response plan as an appendices. And um, along with this one, uh, to, to provide more kind of some more um, information on this is the indicator summary. And this kind of talks about the indicators that we're using. And uh, so the Oglala Sioux Tribe mitigation strategies are aimed at reducing the spread of infection. And um, <clears throat> we want to ensure, by doing this, we want to ensure that our public health capacity is not exceeded. And we, when we talk about public health capacity, what we're talking about is our ability to respond to an outbreak. And so, for example, when we had over 500 cases, it hit us pretty hard in terms of our ability to respond adequately. So we had so many people that were in quarantine and isolation and we had to provide food and supplies to them. And we also had a, a high need of transportation from various hospitals because people were being sent out of state and we have two vans that, that provide uh, COVID transportations and we also had um, our contact tracers who were spread pretty thin. And unfortunately, the effect of that was that we don't have um, adequate data from that time period because the contract contact tracers were not submitting written documentation of, of um, their numbers and stuff. So, so we missed out on some of the data there. And, um, and, and that is because of uh, the high cases that we had during that time. So we want to be able to um, anticipate if that's going to happen again so that we're prepared. We also want to try to prevent that from happening, happening again. So this is why we want to use this color level chart and monitor the data on a regular basis. Um, so the indicators that um, we're using, like I said, um, we're going to do a look back over 21 days because it's a 14 day incub incubation period for the virus. Um, we want to make sure that we can get at least um, one week worth of complete data. Um, <clears throat> so we're using the incidence of cases, how many new cases per population have occurred in the last 14 days, because this shows the potential for spread um, and the incidence as it relates to the risk level. So the CDC uses 50 cases per 100,000 residents to estimate the resident, um, and so we're using the estimated resident population at 20,000 for the purposes of calculating here. Um, so a low incidence for us is less than two cases per 20,000 residents over a 14-day period. And the high incidence is 20 cases or more per 20,000 residents over a 14-day period. This makes it more localized and more realistic for us in terms of um, how we wanna respond to it. Um, the sustained increase of cases using a seven day moving average, a sustained increase in cases over five consecutive days indicates a high risk level. Five days is the minimum used by the CDC to determine a tra trajectory, whether it's going up or down. So. Our percent positivity, there's three methods that the CDC uses. This, we're, we're utilizing the test over test method, which measures the number of positive tests um, divided by the total number of tests, both positive and negative combined. High positivity rates may indicate that there are more positive cases that have not been detected. This may indicate a need for more testing and whether the additional testing is impacting the trajectory of the disease or broader community spread. And right now, um, if, we're, if we have less than 30 persons being tested per day, um, it's probably not enough testing to detect uh, some of the asymptomatic cases that are out there. Um, so that's a concern. <clears throat> the sustained increase in emergency department visits kind of shows us um, what's going on in terms of um, the uh, uh, virus in terms of um, symptomatic patients, how many are coming into the, the department with uh, symptoms. 
And then um, the sustained increase in hospitalizations, this also, also goes to healthcare capacity. And then of course, our ability to um, respond as well. So like I said, um, during that surge, um, it, was, um, it was a big effort on emergency management and um, the COVID initiative director to make sure that people had transportation from the hospitals that they were being sent to and also um, transporting them to the quarantine site or to the homes to where to wherever it is that they could isolate. Um, so those are uh, the indicators that we're using uh, to determine um, this kind of the, the data. And then um, this is I'm this isn't uh, this is just a worksheet that I'm going to share um, in terms of how we look at it. So putting all the data together that uh, George puts out into kind of a worksheet and we do it uh, weekly <coughs> and it lists all the indicators and we put the numbers, we plug the numbers in and then we calculate them. And then, so the summary as of February 28th, uh, the incidence of new cases was 20 cases over a 14 day period, but there was no sustained increase over five consecutive days. Hospitalizations, we had six cases with no sustained increase in hospitalizations and has actually come down um, from the, uh, I think we were at 12 uh, prior to that. And then um, right now we don't have the information for the emergency department visits. Dr. Jumping Eagle is working on that. Um, there's some uh, uh, discussion about the, um, the way it's coded when people come in for uh, illness uh, with, with flu-like symptoms as well. So there's some coding stuff that they have to work through. And then the positivity rate uh, for the last seven days from uh, February uh, 28th was 7.73%. And then again, testing below 30 tests per day indicates insufficient testing to adequately detect cases within the reservation. So based on the above data, the current indicated risk level is yellow. And that's how we come up with um, the risk level. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have any questions on this? What I, what I would like to also show you is um, when we reached out to the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's health board, they provided a, a risk level indicator as well. Um, the difference here, so so uh, the Great Plains calculates all the surrounding areas of a tribe as well. And right now, currently, all the tribes in South Dakota are in the red level. And so um, that's why it's important for us to kind of do our own. But at the same time, we need to bear in mind what's going on around us because that puts us at risk. So even though we're kind of an island unto ourselves, we all go to Rapid City and do business. We all go to Shadron and do business. We all go to Gordon, Rushville. You know, we go to all these places surrounding us who are, um, who are also having uh, differences in terms of um, what their, what their uh, community spread is. So for now, right now, as of today, Pennington County still has um, significant community spread, even though we're down into the moderate level and Bennett County and Jackson County are in the, um, the minimal uh, community spread. So it, now, we, even though we're in the yellow level, now is not the time to um, think that we're, we're free and clear here. So. Um, it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm open for any questions that anybody has. This is something that we would like the tribe to adopt in it, it, as a, appendices to the current uh, infectious disease response plan. And um, and yeah, that's that's all I got to say. Any questions, Council?
So if there are none, we will be looking to add that to our um, that response plan. Is that correct, Ray? Yeah, it would be nice to have approval or, or you know, some acknowledgement from tribal council. You are our leaders. You know, um, one of the other things that I would like to do is correlate our health orders to this chart, which I haven't had a chance to do yet. Um, so that, you know, because um, one of the questions came up or one of the, the thoughts is, so if if we have a shelter in place ordinance in the red level, at what point do we um, lift that shelter in place? Um, so, you know, that's a legislative call. And so the question kind of comes up, do we want to amend the shelter in place to um, correlate with this color coded chart so that um, once we enter into the orange or yellow level, the shelter in place automatically lifts. And then if we go back into the red level, it automatically um, is reinstated or does council want to issue a new stay at home stay at home order shelter in place order each time we go into the red level or the orange level whichever level you guys would would want to take action so um, that goes for the, uh, the curfew ordinance as well and then one of the other things that we would like to request is that the that you uh, maintain the mask uh, a mask ordinance throughout the pandemic. Councilwoman uh, Little Hawk Wesson. Thank you. Um, I think uh, yesterday we did have law and order committee and this is one of the uh, topics of discussion was our shelter in place ordinance, Rayanne, and also the curfew ordinance. And so the curfew <laughs> ordinance is on the agenda today as a two thirds item. And I think today the uh, legislators will, you know, vote on that, uh, yes or no, and whether it passes or not, but it is on the agenda today. I think the, you kind of brought some, um, some, some thoughts to how we should look at this shelter in place ordinance, because I did address it yesterday in law and order because um, I don't know, uh, there's quite a bit of our tribal membership that did get their vaccine. Some didn't get it. There's still some hesitation from our people to get it. And so I think um, that education really needs to get out there. But I do want to say that uh, these um, the level chart is something that I really think we should support because it tells and explains to the tribal members what level we're at. And I think when you're talking about looking at the shelter in place, I think that um, this is something that uh, we should uh, maybe share with uh, our attorneys, Mr. Gunn, Steve Gunn, because he is working on that shelter in place ordinance. We'll bring it back to the Law and Order Committee next Wednesday. And that uh, we would like to um, uh, amend that ordinance because of the vaccine and uh, the, the state of where the tribe is at today. You know, our people are moving around. They're doing, uh, like you said, don't let our guards down, but uh, kind of feel like our people are kind of moving in that direction of, uh, of, of normalcy. And I think that uh, right now, you know, Mr. Ironpaw brought up a, a question about, uh, you know, the council meeting in Rapid City on weekends, you know, and if you look at the shelter in place, it does state that in there that if you're gone more than 24 hours, you should self quarantine for 14 days. That's still a law. That's still the council's law. Whether it was passed last administration or not, it's still a law. So we need to look at that as tribal leaders and we need to modify it to what our need is today, our current need today and with the vaccine. So we did have Steve look at that. So he is working on it, but you know, I would like for our council to uh, adopt this because uh, I have a daughter that lives in Denver, Colorado and over there, the, you know, the positive cases are much higher than here. And, uh, but they have a level chart. So they know what level they're at and they're always told what level they are at and what they should do and shouldn't do. 
So I really feel that this will help our people here on the reservation to understand that. But, um, you know, I don't know uh, if we need to uh, make a motion to to adopt this as part of the, um, what is it, the health, as part of the health uh, order, health administration. I think it, what was you saying uh, earlier, Leanne? It's, a, it's part of our emergency operations manual. Um, when this first started, we adopted the infectious disease response plan. Yeah. And within that plan, it allows uh, to, um, it recognizes the changes with for the plan itself, just because we knew things would be changing. Nobody knew what, you know, what to expect from this virus or the pandemic. And so the response plan is kind of a living document as well. So in there, um, it allows uh, to to add or or change it, um, and then just update council on it. But what after reading through it again, we we as the task force think that we need to uh, really bring it up to date in terms of some of the terminology too that's in there. So, but uh, what we wanted to do is go ahead and add this as an appendices because there are appendices to that and add this to it as part of the plan. But what we're asking for is that council supports it because without leadership support, our people aren't gonna care either, you know? So that's what we're asking for. Okay, and I think that um, it should maybe go along with what uh, we get every day from uh, the HR office that uh, Ms. Puyer puts out is it on a daily basis on the COVID-19 uh, report on the positives in each of the nine districts and um, the breakdown that you showed us earlier, this should be a part of that because that's going to help uh, educate our tribal membership uh, uh, across the reservation as to um, you know what level that we are on. So I really would like to maybe support this. Um, I don't know if council has any questions, but I really think it's a it's a it's a starting point, and I think it helps us as leadership to um, allow for the task force to work on these things, uh, bring it back. I think that um, I just wanted to say that today that the curfew ordinance is going to be discussed today. But I like to make that motion, Mr. Chair, to uh, to support the. Um, Oglala Sioux Tribe's COVID-19 response uh, risk alert level chart, uh, along with uh, what Ms. Puya puts out every day. We can kind of work it together to make sure that goes out to our tribal membership. That'd be my motion. We have a motion and a second by Councilman DeBray. Councilman Carlo. Thank you, Madam Vice. Uh, my motion was going to be to accept it too, with the exception of what we're sending back on the National Guard to the committee. So I think it's important. You know, we had a lot of comments, you know, pros and cons to do in the meeting. So I think the message still has to go out there to our people, you know, that we're not by far out of the woods and that we continue to practice safety. So I think if we do that motion, we need to remove that one part of, as far as approving this report that's going back to committee. Question, yes. did, did this come from the HHS committee already? We sent it to the, we took it to HHS, but there wasn't time to review it last, uh, this past Tuesday, so. So, so now it came to the uh, tribal council I guess Ryan, being the chair of the committee, Ryan, what do you think about that? Is about which part, Sonia? To uh, support the Ogala Sioux Tribe COVID nineteen response, that risk alert level chart that they're asking for support from the council. Yeah, that that I mean, I guess it's up to council. It's before us here today. I mean, it didn't go to committee, and I don't know. Um, she gave us the paper there at our committee meeting, but I mean, it's up to you guys. And, and to answer Mike's comment, you know, that was the only portion we took action on was the National Guard part. So that should be my motion. 
So we still have a motion and yeah. a second on the floor. Any other questions or comments, Council? Seeing none online, I don't know. One, two, three, four, five. What's that? No, no hands up on one. Madam Secretary, can you call the vote, please? Is that with uh, Mr. Carlos' addition? I don't think it's allowed to be to the desk. No. Sonia, uh, er earlier, earlier we talked about that issue with the National Bar. That's the one that. They said, I think it was taken back. Yeah, that was the table, that was a separate issue. Yeah. That was separate from the level. Right, well, my yeah. deal was. This one. Right. Yeah, with, that's what my back to the table said. Yeah, and I said with that exception. So I have the uh, motion made by Sonia Little Hop Weston, seconded by um, Ron Bray. To support the OST COVID response team, COVID-19 response team risk alert level chart and the daily reports by the OST Health Administration, with the exception of the portion of the National Guard referring back to the HHS committee. Wesley Hawkins Sr. Yes. Blaine Little Thunder. Cora Whitehorse. Brian Jumping Eagle Sr. Yes. Gerald Canoyer Jr. Yes. Austin Watkins Sr. Welcome. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Yeldman Jr. Yes. Ron Debray. Oh. James Cross. Yes. Ella Giancarlo. George Jr. Jr. Yes. Richard Ironcloud. Oh, yes. David Puyer. No. Sonia Little Hawk Weston. Ha. Uh, Michael Carlo Sr. Yes. Garco Still. Yep. Craig Dillon. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're attached. 14 yes, one no, three not voting. That passes. Thank you, Council, for that support. We're going to be wrapping up our presentation here. We do always give you guys other issues because there's a lot of other things that we do with the task force. So um, there's always more need for help with the quarantine sites, the homeless shelter, food and donations, and transportation of COVID 19 patients. We also know schools are reopening. So um, one big thing is looking at their HVAC systems and making sure there's proper flow of air, even in our program, and all of our all of our different programs that, that really helps with mitigating. Um, meetings will be held uh, with the schools and reopening, I mentioned that. And there's also some outstanding bills that need to be paid that are impacting emergency management department. Um, so that is an issue that is hindering some of their um, work. We also have the Binex Now anti-agents test that could be used for casino staff and schools as well as other tribal programs. We'll be exploring those further and letting you know at the end of the month um, about that. But those are some trainings that we can give for programs and schools and utilize in all these areas to, to test. Um, another one is we do know that there are uh, in people who are post-COVID infected persons, there are some health complications. So some other issues are looking at some of those other health in, um, outcomes, inclu including pulmonary function. We do not have money for that, but um, they are looking for research. Like I said, we're learning things every day. So those are some of the other issues that the task force has been looking at and addressing. And so we always also have other recommendations. Uh, one of them is paying those outstanding invoices for the past COVID operations and helping e emergency management uh, get back to operating and pay those bills, including porta potties, 
uh, quarantine sites uh, and fuel bills. So uh, if we can look into those, that is a recommendation so that we can continue to operate. We also, um, there's a lot of conversation about border monitoring and utilizing those resources toward contact tracing, quarantine sites, security staff, testing, and other response efforts. So that is another recommendation that the task force has made over, I believe, since October is utilizing border monitors to fill those other needs that we have. Um, so the approval of the presidential letter of support, we will go back to the drawing board on that for the National Guard and see where we're at with that. In the meantime, we'll continue the vaccination events um, in the communities and figuring out how to reach those homebound people. And I do know CHR has been working on that and have only identified a couple. So we're still trying to figure that piece out. We also, um, like I mentioned, the HVAC systems, we would recommend setting monies aside from those new monies that are coming to address those HVAC systems in our programs, in our buildings, in our schools, so that we have that in place as, as an effort to reduce the spread. Um, the, and then the recommendations for the COVID-19 response risk chart, thank you again for that support on that. Um, we wanted to continue to encourage people to stay home and, and do only necessary movement. Uh, but now we can use that risk level chart to help people understand where we're at with our risk level and what, what we can do individually in our, in our work environments and our, you know, in our communities. So that's awesome. Thank you guys for that. That provides some clarity. Uh, we also want to recommend continue the mask mandate throughout. We know masks are important. Social distancing important. Washing hands is important. Um, so we are going to be getting education out on that, utilizing our community. Like I said, our community is awesome. So I did want to end on our community being awesome and, and stepping up to help us get some of these um, pictures out, uh, you know, and some of this information to our community. So we do have um, Uncle Rick and Auntie Ethelene who have stepped up and really helped um, and donated their, their language and the time to help us get some, and also Chris, Mr. Chris Eaglehawk. He's amazing. He's been helping us a lot to get information out. So we do, we are working on some of these efforts to get a lot of these pieces out to our communities, these through social media. We'll be printing posters and other things as well with these messages and, and really encourage our community and thanking them for taking care of each other, wearing their masks, social distancing, washing their hands, you know, and doing those things we know work and getting vaccinated. So. Um, we'll also be utilizing, trying to get some like signs to encourage our community and get them out there. This is one potential sign uh, by Mr. Marty Tubles Jr. Uh, road signs to put up their, their approaches, just to encourage people. I know we've been staying home a lot, but it is awesome to see these kind of messaging in our community to encourage us to continue to stay strong and wear our masks, social distance, wash our hands and get vaccinated. I'll keep saying those things because all those things will help us to reduce the risk um, and reduce the spread and, and get us back to moving around and seeing our loved ones and taking care of each other. And this is just another new part of how we take care of each other. So with that, um, that is the end of our report and we will be reporting to you guys at the end of the month um, with, with more updates and, and recommendations and anything that pops up, we'll, we'll be bringing it to you all um, at my, vice president's report but i just wanted to once again thank you guys for giving us this time to update you on what has been going on and the current efforts with vaccinations and all those pieces and let you know that we are here to provide you know support to our programs like i said we're meeting with the schools we're here to you know if you have any questions about how to move forward with certain things please feel free to reach out to us like i said it's a team effort and we're all a part of this team so any questions, Council? Yes, Councilman Carlo. Moving forward, you know, I'd just like to thank you and the committee of the task force for their presentation. And FYI, you know, an HVAC system, each individual HVAC costs about $2,300 to sanitize. So it, it, however many each one of our schools our facilities, that's kind of a dollar figure that you're going to be looking at. But we also do have an enrolled member who has a business, you know, on sanitizing too. And we're trying to push for, you know, the Buy Indian Act to use as many of our local businesses 
as we can. So I think it's important that, you know, the information is shared that we do have an enrolled member that has a business that can do the sanitizing. So if that information can be spread to it, then I appreciate it. For sure, and, you know, we have all of our processes internally, laws internally use native owned and also um, Dean is on it. Just kidding. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, council? Thank you for that, Council Mercado. All right, seeing none, any online? Um, well, thank you again, Council. And like I said, if you guys have any questions about COVID-19, the task force is here to help with those and, and provide recommendations. And I um, want to encourage people, once again, continue to wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, and, and get vaccinated if you wish to. Thank you. Oh, yes, Councilman Watkins. <laughs> uh, no, I want to. I want to thank um, those border patrols, which are very monitors. Um, I have people tell me that they was happy to have them out there because I guess in uh, Montana Crow Agency, they're having a lot of problems with young women disappearing. So with our monitors out there that really um, have kept them people from coming in here and taking our children. So I wanna thank them. And um, you know, when we come through there in the evening, sometimes there's always just girls at those monitors. I don't know where all the men are. He took from Manderson, so I don't know what's going on there, but <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. <laughs> I think, I think the women from Madison are stronger than some of you men. So. If there are no other questions or comments for the task force, thank you for your time again, and uh, we'll take another we'll take a fifteen minute break and then uh, go on.